Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today, we're talking with Abhishek Lahoti, host of One Simple Question, the podcast. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hello, innovators. Uh, my name is Abhishek Lahoti. I am a podcast creator, as well as just somebody who seems to have a strange curiosity for all the things in the world. And uh, I'm really excited to to chat a little bit about what I've been up to and what I'm planning to do and hopefully making sense of all this crazy time that we're in. Right. Well, and there's uh, a lot of really interesting topics we have on the questions and stuff like today. So this is a show about becoming a polymath in all the areas of interest along the way. You're here to talk about his very interesting podcast, being an expat and creating your own meaning in life. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. So why don't we start off by you sharing something about yourself that no one knows about you? Oh gosh, something that no one knows about me. Um, I'm fairly open in general, but I think I'm open to specific people. So this, the one thing people might not realize is as they're learning a lot about me, there's a person that might be in the same city in like a different apartment that I talk to regularly who knows a completely different version of me. Mm -hmm. And um, not in like a duplicitous way, but just by virtue of who I'm talking to, I tend to try to showcase what I think they'd be most interested in. Um, and I think it's just one of those things growing up, wanting to people to like you, it, it turns into a thing as an adult when you have a lot to talk about. I'm trying to tailor what I can say just to that one person. I love that. It's actually kind of a uh, polymathic in a way too. You have to have that, you have to have that social knowledge and that emotional intelligence to know who you're talking to and to coordinate your own like body language and mindset to that person. And it kind of reminds me of Gary V and just, like I said, polymath. It's cool. Yeah. So why don't we dive right in? You just finished your first season of your podcast. How do you feel? I am exhausted. Oh. It was really fun to do. I can tell anybody right now who is thinking about doing a podcast, it's very achievable, but it is definitely a lot of work. You can't just get it done quickly mm -hmm. if you want to be good about it. So I started the podcast in November of last year. I started recording episodes in November of last year started editing episodes, finding new people to interview, publishing just continuously until about May of this year. Man. So yeah, it took a lot out of me. Uh, it was really fun. It was very, very focused work. Uh, I would stay late one once a week at my office mm -hmm. and just edit my episode for the next week. And so I'd be in there till 10 o'clock with the cleaning crews, just going to town. Yeah. So I'm really excited with how it turned out. I think I had some amazing conversations and I'm happy to take a little bit of a break before I cue things up a bit better for next year well and you probably learned some areas of your workflow that could be improved or something like that it is interesting how you were saying how you're staying up late uh editing like on saturday sunday i was just editing for six hours straight just on one episode you get into a groove right it's just it's such deep simple work that you just can't stop until you're done but mm -hmm. to your point of like getting better at my workflow dustin i can tell you like i need to fix so much of that that was one of those things that i just did at the time, what made sense for me, and now I know with retrospect that I could really easily optimize that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. There's a lot of tools out there for it, and it's kind of on that same point. Just this week, I decided that uh, after launching the second season of my podcast here, I had a lot of awesome guests right off the bat. I'm having an awesome guests like you right now, and I wanted to spread it out and make things more consistent. So I'm starting to do a weekly release of the interviews on Tuesdays. And so that will give me much more time to edit and not feel overwhelmed because I was just cranking them out as soon as I was getting them. And so I was like, okay, let's take a step back, be able to focus on other parts of Poly Innovator and that kind of thing. So I get you. Yeah. If you were to break down your biggest learning point from this whole experience, what was it? I feel like everybody that I met through the course of my podcast and my interviewing uh, had the opportunity to, to take advantage of something. Mm -hmm. They're presented with some sort of challenge. Uh, I very much believe in the hero's journey aspect of our uh, collective anthropology and every single person had a call to action. Mm. I think we all get these every now and again. And what made the guests really interesting is that whatever their call to action was, which was like family, uh, the death of a loved one, a war, for example, they all decided to go down a specific and treacherous and somewhat windy path, but as a result have gotten to the point where they were talking to me very openly about that. Mm -hmm. So if I could take away the one big thing, which was what I learned over the whole course of the, the season was opportunities will pop up in front of us and it, it can mean literally nothing to you. 
if you see it and you do nothing, and that's fine. But some of these people have had the most amazing stories and the most amazing focuses of their life and the biggest changes because they saw one of those opportunities and they actually decided to go for it. Right. And so that's one of those things I'm trying to keep now uh, as I go on forward, which is looking at opportunities and actually taking them rather than wondering what might have been. Yeah, that's deep. It's it's interesting too, just because many people, like you said, they don't even see the opportunities, but if they do, they don't go and take them because there's a lot of times it might take just a mild amount of effort just to get started, but it's an amount of effort that you have to come from nowhere. You have to just go and do it and just to get started. And then it might even take more after that, but regardless of how much effort it takes, just identifying opportunities and being willing to try them. It's a very crucial. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about call to actions and kind of like a why, and so to speak, like your pa a passion for these people to pursue their goals and their opportunities. If you could break down what your central why or call to action is, what do you think that might be? I mean, as strange as it's going to sound, it's it's experience of as many things as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a little on the nose for your podcast. The... Perfect, actually, considering. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had... Yeah, I had this experience ages ago. Uh, I was in Peru. I was doing ayahuasca in a yurt in the middle of the uh, Andes Mountains with uh, a bunch of friends. And I asked the question in my deep, you know, psychological view, uh, the psychedelic experience that I was in, I asked the question of like, what was my own meaning and what I was aiming for? And partially what I got out of that, because there's a lot to it, obviously, you don't just get like a really simple like word answer was the experience of adventure and the experience of uh, of not being good at something and then becoming somewhat knowledgeable and better at that thing to a point that you can speak more knowledgeably than you could before and then ultimately teach somebody something. So my, my sense I got and like the visual experience that I had was one of adventure and curiosity. And it's, there have been times in my life where I've stopped doing that and I missed on larger adventures and I would take small, tiny endeavors just to learn uh, and to try a new thing for like a month at a time. Mm -hmm. But failing those, I kind of needed that bigger sense of, okay, what is this new thing I want to learn and tackle? So I always get that question, like, what is your passion? My passion isn't a singular thing. Right. It, it might just be learning. Learning might be just the passion in whatever facet that I get to. Yeah, the divergent and polymathic learning in a way where you have those multiple areas of interest, uh, multi-potentialite or even autodidact are two terms that might be quite fitting for that self-learner yeah. and that kind of thing. Do you think it might change, like your your uh, call to action might change in the future? Absolutely. I'm, I'm 34 years old now. I'm living in a different country than I grew up in. I'm trying a podcast for the first time. I have all this energy and I really am focusing that energy, but there might be a time in 15 years where my energy is lower. I'm a bit more quiet and settled and perhaps my focus would be shifted just slightly. I think ultimately the learning is probably going to stick with me for a little bit just because I really find value in diving deep into a topic. Even if I can't explain all of the things, I want to be able to understand that there's a facet that I don't understand, you know, getting that idea that, you know, that you don't know much. I used to play the drums and I got really good after a year or so I thought, and then I watched like Yusuf Davies play drums. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not that good. Yeah. I got past this first big hump of learning of the drums. And now there's just a huge sea in front of me that I could get out of. Mm -hmm. And really delve into it. And you're saying that like you're living in a country you weren't born in and you've traveled so much. So let's kind of circle back around. Where were you born? Oh yeah, sorry. By way of introduction, I was born in Ohio in the US, a small town called Canton, Ohio, um, football hall of fame for those of you who know that. And I uh, grew up there until I was 18, went to school in Chicago, spent 10 years in San Francisco, and now I live in London. Wow, that's a really kind of like a crazy pathway there. Zigzaggy. Zigzaggy is a good term. Zigzaggy, yeah. And it's it's funny that you grew up in the kind of Midwest because that's where I'm in now, Columbia, Missouri. So Yeah. What's uh, up, Midwest? Love it. Love it. Midwest, the people of the Midwest are amongst the best people in the world that I've met. They're always somewhat more cheery and easy to talk to mm -hmm. and have this like vivaciousness at meeting someone who they've like has something they've never done before and you're really excited. Whereas sometimes in California, if you don't surf, the person who surfs a lot is like, I don't really want to talk to you that much. <laughs> It's crazy. 
too too <laughs> aloof or so to speak. Or uh, so I, I get like with your tech background, why you'd want to go to San Francisco. But what brought you to London? Bit of adventure, to be honest. Uh, per the previous thing I said, I had been there for about a decade. Uh, I had done a lot in life. I had you know bought a house. I, I took a, a new job. I, I grew in that job. I became you know kind of senior in that position as a uh, solutions architect and and just various positions in tech. I fell in love. I uh, fell out of love after that a couple of times, actually. And I experienced a lot. I really felt like I I became really more of an adult in SF. When I got there, I was a young adult, and I feel like I just grew up. And so when an opportunity to move to London came across my lap, I thought, this is one of those moments that I could easily just be like, life is comfortable. It's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. You have all these things that have set you up really nicely, and you don't really need to rock the boat. But I had this nagging sensation that, I could have easily just like slipped into a very early and comfortable state of life, but never really wondered what else there was or looked across the ocean and wondered, you know, what's it like to rent a flat in North London and try to figure out like what council tax is. Like those are just things that wouldn't have crossed my brain. Well, it, it seems like you're not the kind of person to really sit still like that. And I think that you might have gone kind of probably crazy if you probably stayed there too much. You you want to have that sense of adventure. And it, it you say you're 34, and when you said it, it almost seemed like you were saying that you have grown a lot. But 34 is still really young in the grand scheme of things. We usually people live to like 80 or 100. You still have a whole life ahead of you there. And it's interesting how just even in these three decades of your life there you've already amassed a wealth of experience and wisdom. It's great. Yeah. I mean, that wisdom is red on my face because I have a lot of gray hair and you can tell that I have all the wrinkles as well for it. Um, I'm an old looking 34, but uh, all jokes aside, I, I generally feel like I had a really fast run up to this mm -hmm. and I wouldn't, I would hate for it to just become a coasting mechanism from here. I'd love for it to continue to be a bit more upward until at which point I need to like pause and take a breather, which I, I do find time to do when I can. Yeah, it's always good to take a step back and relax. And I think that um, because every decade or so, I think that's why like a lot of CEOs take a couple of weeks off just for themselves every year. Yeah, I was just talking uh, to people today about needing to shut my emails off. Mm -hmm. We're all working from home now. We're in coronavirus at the moment. And being able to work from home is a really, really great luxury for a job. But at 7 p.m., because I have a lot of meetings with the U.S. still, mm -hmm. I might be totally switched into work and I should stop. And so I'll get up and I'll start making dinner and I'll start doing other things. But my phone is just so handy to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. But I wake up at, you know, eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock in the morning and I get ready and no one from the U.S. is active at that hour. So I could just wait and just catch up then. And it would make the same kind of time difference in the end. I, I think I need to learn that sort of balance a bit more. And that's the current, the current chore on my list. I mean, just kind of increasing the barriers to entry, so to speak. Like they, they always say, like I think in Atomic Habits, where if you want to learn guitar and not play as much video games, for example, you take the video game controller, put it in a drawer in the back, and then put the guitar front and center and just make it easier to choose the positive choice. So like one thing, for example, I, I deleted Facebook Messenger off my phone. So that way I don't use that at all on my cellular device. I have to go on the desktop and that's made it easier to not use Facebook nearly as much. Yeah. I should probably end up doing that. My family still calls me a lot on Facebook Messenger here, mm -hmm. which is one of those interesting things about having all, most of the people, most of your people sitting in the US and you're not there. It's just like trying to keep those lines of communication are really important. But, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need to have Reddit on my phone. I don't think I need to have Instagram on my phone um, until I start publishing again. That was really the big purpose of it. So, so you're about what, seven hours ahead? Yeah, I think so. I'm. Let's see. I'm eight hours ahead from San Francisco, six from Chicago. It's probably, what, evening for you now, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's 7.15 here. Thank you for taking the time then in your evening too. And I, I <laughs> no, also worry. apologize for sending you so many emails. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. I actually appreciate uh, doing this kind of thing at the end of my day because when I was publishing, I was doing more of these things at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And it was not as if I was working anymore. I felt like I was doing a different task and my brain switched off of the emails and what I do and the tech stuff. And it was more tied to like, okay, the creativity and trying to make sure that I got a good recording and, you know, making sure everything's on correctly and I'm getting the right conversations in. So one thing you've talked about in some of your content is that you take the concept of creating your own meeting. I create my own meaning. Can you explain that more? Yeah, it, it stems from a life led as a minority mm -hmm. in a country where um, the majority was of a different religion and a different look. And I don't mean that in any sort of negative way. I just mean it's just a fact of my life. I'm, I'm an Indian man. 
uh, rather my parents were from India and I am a practicing Hindu. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times in life, I would get this interesting conversation, this like experience where someone would think that it would be their job or, or perhaps their calling to tell me that I'm wrong uh, in some way or shape uh, of my life. If it's culturally in terms of the dress that we'd wear for an event or religiously in terms of the prayers that I would say or the gods that I worship at the time. And when you're young, you are kind of open to that. You're, you're not sure what's right or wrong. I went to Catholic school for a couple of years too, because there was a great school, but you know, couldn't do communion or anything like that because I wasn't baptized. Right. But I started to travel. And I noticed when I traveled, especially in Europe, that there were a lot of missionaries. And I traveled with really, really sound-minded Christian individuals sometimes who never tried to throw their faith on me or anything, but would go and challenge these missionaries and have these conversations. And inevitably, I would get involved as well. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that the underlying facet of a lot of that, for me at least, was there were a lot of people who were trying to tell you what your meaning was based on the scriptures that they believed in. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm, again, not a religious scholar. I love to read about religion. I'm super interested in understanding how they work and uh, the dogmatic version of it that, that got us here. But what I noticed that really bugged me throughout the course of it was that my meaning was not something anybody would be able to tell me. Like, I couldn't even have my parents really tell me what my meaning was. We butt heads constantly on mm -hmm. what I'm doing, why am I out here, the religion that I am and, and I follow. Uh, even though we're all the same, it, it just doesn't seem like what it is. Sorry, it doesn't seem like what theirs is. Mm -hmm. So when I say I create my own meaning, the idea is that I have a sense of what I'm trying to do and the goals I'm trying to achieve and the, and the general ethos that I want my life to have. And, and what's important to me is that I don't ever tell anybody that they have to do that as well. I get a lot of friends who ask for just advice, as, as we all do. And I have to remember oftentimes that they aren't me and they don't think the same way as me. And so the challenges that I put in front of them can't be voiced in my own head. They have to be voiced for their own head. And so that's generally the sense of meaning in my head. Like I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to convince them to be a certain way. If anything, I would love for someone to see maybe what I'm doing and understand the openness that I'm keeping and try to mimic it in the way that makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. But for me to sit there on a street corner and tell you, Dustin, that you need to follow the way that I follow seems really disingenuous because I honestly don't know the however many years uh, of experience that got you to the point that you're at. So there's no way for me to actually tell you what the next batch of years should look like. Definitely. I, I resonate with your openness there. It's, it's interesting how, well, and especially in the U S I feel like people are very preachy, I guess is the word to kind of use where hey, your religion's wrong. Mine is better. And I think that in, the, in other countries in the middle East and even some European countries, their religion takes a pretty strong, aspect of human existence but it's interesting how when people can keep an open mind like you regardless of background religion and that sort of thing it really opens up the doors to proper dialogue and expanding the mind and one of my favorite classes in high school was classical ideas and world religions where we literally went through pretty much every religion major religion out there from christianity to baha'i to hinduism and Islam and we it was one of my best classes I ever took because not only was the teacher phenomenal but it was also a very expanding like mind expanding experience. I honestly wish I had that opportunity. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Ohio so we didn't really have that much diversity in thought let's put it that way. I'm very grateful for the town I grew up in because it got me to where I am today and it built the you know the kid that could potentially do well enough in college to get to where I am today but I would love for someone to sit there and try to like teach us about how the world actually functioned and worked but you know it seems like it's really big and when you're in that small town that small town seems like it's big enough mm -hmm. and there were a lot of people who not in any bad way just didn't want to leave that and and I totally respect that um I think just as a person who had immigrant parents I couldn't I couldn't bring that together in my head I, I knew they had come from somewhere far away so I felt like I needed to also try something else far away they inspired you to kind of reach out your comfort zone. They did. They would hate to know that they inspired me to move across the world uh, again after they were like, we already left a country to settle in and have a good life for you in that country. <laughs> they left to come here. Why did, you, why did you think it was necessary for you to come back as well? But that being said, my parents, though they probably don't say it enough because no parent these days is like really on it uh, for, for our generation, are probably pretty proud of how we all got here because of the three siblings and myself um 
everybody had their struggles and their trials, but we all showed a good level of resilience, which I really appreciate uh, that they taught us. Definitely. I love it. Just kind of pivoting a little bit there. I see your background with all of the liquors and the various drinks. I heard you're a mixologist of sorts. I love to mix drinks myself. Uh, what are some interesting combinations you've made? Yeah. Um, I forgot I had a Zoom background of a bar. Uh, that's my work Zoom background, which I really still love to do. And I confuse people because apparently it looks like I might, I might be in a bar sometimes. Um, yeah, I was a bartender for many years uh, as one of the things that I wanted to do. And I continue doing it. So I, I actually teach classes for charity right now, um, mostly online through Zoom, obviously, but just doing it across the world to like teach people how to drink for about two hours and then um, donate that money to uh, some COVID relief fundraising. The drinks that I really get into are now just been like, what can we find? Um, so the biggest thing that I've enjoyed recently was that I've been making a lot of chickpea-based foods. Okay. So uh, an Indian dish called uh, chole or chana um, or just hummus uh, and salads, obviously. But taking chickpea water and using it as a substitute for egg whites was actually pretty fun. Interesting. Uh, it's one of those things that I never really knew would happen, what would happen. But I have a very good friend in Copenhagen named Brett who threw me onto the idea because he's vegan. Mm. So I've been making a whiskey sour, a gin sour, and mixing it up a bit, but then uh, doing it with chickpea water or aquafaba is what it's called. That's been probably the coolest thing I've learned over lockdown. It was one of those like really random facts that uh, as I got more and more into it, I realized everybody knew and that I just hadn't picked up on yet. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Like this very uh, peculiar drink, so to speak, no one would have probably thought of that. And what kind of got you into mixology? Like what, what was the fascination with it? Gosh, the story is embarrassing, but I was in my mid twenties. I had been introduced to the idea of old fashions. Yeah. Someone was like, Hey, do you want an old fashioned? And I went out and ordered old fashions wherever I would go, but I would get the really weird mad many version, which is like muddled cherry, muddled orange peel, sugar in the water, soda water. Uh, yeah, me too. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I couldn't do it. I was like, this is trash. What is going on? Uh, and if I if I have offended anybody who makes their old fashions that way, I don't care because I fully believe you're making it wrong. Yeah. And that's one hill I'm willing to die on. Um, but I realized like, hey, why are you you know mixing your old fashions this way? It doesn't seem to make much sense. So I looked up how to make an old fashioned properly, and I was like, I'm just gonna make this at home to get into it. And then uh, a really good friend of mine and I lived above this bar in San Francisco. It was a restaurant, Thai restaurant, but a very 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 small stock bar. And that guy's bartender would make that old fashioned that I just mentioned, that was really bad. And we became good friends and we just started to catch up more and more. And I asked him one day, I was like, can I just go back there and make this for you the right way? Like the actual correct way to make an old fashioned. He's like, yeah, absolutely go for it. He was a legend in that way. And uh, one thing led to another and I just started like helping him make more drinks. And he was like, let me make, let me show you how to make the lychee martini that we have. Let me show you how to make this really interesting like tequila and date based Thai chili cocktail that they had. And then I just got really interested. And so I bought a bar kit and I started testing some stuff out. But what really changed is that in 2014, when I wasn't working and I had taken some time off, I just went up to him and I said, can I work at your bar as a bar back or even as a bartender? So he was like, yeah, sure, go for it. Like, you're going to learn the quick way how a restaurant works and how this industry works. Because he knew I was like pampered and had only worked nine to five jobs. And it was fascinating. It was super fun. So that just kicked off the whole process of me understanding how bars work, how mixology works. And then from there, you know, that was six years ago. Here we are. It's interesting how, like you were saying that, that your different jobs have both uh, changed how your views could be because like nine to five, definitely, if like you said, kind of cushy, almost in a way where you're going to have a very predictable environment versus something like a bartender where you're going to get people that you've never seen before. You're going to get a lot of like very interesting requests. I, I was never a bartender, but I was a barista. And so, I mean, obviously different roles, but still kind of that service mentality and just working mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. And um, one of my favorite bartenders, her name's Juice actually, but uh, she would make me an old fashioned and she would make it kind of like what you're saying with like a, like a, either a cherry or, or an orange. So something really kind of sweet and then she'll put bitters and sugar in. So it, it wasn't actually like a real old fashioned, but I really always liked it. It's funny how you said this, that's what you would get everywhere you go. And that's was like, that's what I did too. <laughs> I feel weird knocking on that old fashioned now that I know that story, but <laughs> I, I have to say like the classical fashion is one of those things that I will mess with and play with as much as possible and try different sweeteners and try different whiskeys and even try different liquors altogether. Um, my biggest advice to people when, when it comes to cocktails is if you like it, then it's a good cocktail. Mm -hmm. So if you start making stuff you don't like, but you think you should, Think about it again, maybe try something different. 
but ultimately like it's pretty easy for you to find something you like just be creative try things like you were cooking in the kitchen today you know we're all making so much more food because we have to grocery stores are running out of ingredients so just find what you think might work in a cocktail and just try it out cucumbers mints ba- you know basil basil as they say out here maybe you'll have some kind of recipe for me that i can put in the comments or something like that but i have something you can try is where i would get like a a nice glass and get some honey trailed up on the sides and then two frozen strawberries a couple shots of spiced rum usually morgan and then the rest with ginger ale oh yeah i've never tried that before that sounds good i'll have to give that a shot yeah. ginger ale or ginger beer um usually ginger ale ale but like i i'm sure it'll probably work with ginger beer too Mm -hmm. i should try it i I think it's i always love honey as a sweetener it's really fun it has a lot of flavor and it mixes Mm -hmm. up really quickly in uh into a weird cocktail well it mixes with ginger really well too yeah yeah do you have any advice like you kind of already did but do you have any advice on someone getting into the field yeah the biggest piece of advice i'll give somebody outside of what i just said is um bartending is all parts oriented it's not measurements don't worry so much about like how many milliliters or how many ounces you have you you obviously should know some of that stuff just so you don't like get really drunk the first time you make a drink but it's about parts more than is anything else so bartenders usually speak in parts that way because it's easy for you to multiply parts together and make more than one drink so i always tell people that there's two good rules and the rules are uh four parts to one part and bitters which is like in old fashioned, so you have four parts of your alcohol, one part of your sweetener, and your bitters. Or then you have your two parts to one part to one part, which is like a Collins or, or a sour, where you have two parts of alcohol, one part of a citrus or a complicated ingredient, and a sweetener. Okay. So just think about things in parts, and then you won't have to worry too much about what you have in your house to measure out. Right. And it's interesting, like you say parts, is that I, I've never really measured what I poured or anything like that, but I've always had a knack for seeing like what ratios would be mixed well together. It's good to know just in general, like what you like as flavor. So if you're a strong whiskey drinker and you're trying to get into cocktails, don't go in the route of the sweet ones. Like you're just not going to enjoy it. So know that when you balance out an old fashioned with your parts, you can balance it out with less sweetener or use, if you're using maple syrup, use a different level than you would if it's a you know very smoky or very nice Canadian whiskey or whatever you're doing there. Interesting. You kind of mentioned your tech field earlier too, that being a solutions architect. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. I stumbled into tech when I was 23 years old. Mm-hmm. I had a really good friend who worked in San Francisco. I was leaving medical school because I didn't want to be a doctor. Yeah. And I was like, what do I do now? But I was always very techie in general, like did help desk in college and just liked computers Mm -hmm. and uh, got into work in San Francisco as just doing whatever they would let me do. My first boss was my mentor. Uh, His name is John Brody. He was just absolutely stunning as a boss. He was the best person to start a career with. Uh, He went to a new company. He was like, do you want to come with? Uh, And and I have a couple of ideas that I have in my, in my midst that I want you to to try to do. And one of them was, the solutions architect rule, we called it sales engineering, but it's effectively the same kind of thing. And he said, look, when we're trying to sell this software, we need someone to explain it, but they have to be personable. I can't take my engineers to do it. I'm doing it right now, but I can't get as deep as they want to get. We need someone like you who's more technical, but also can be personable and have a conversation and not go straight into the jargon, but use just enough to make sure that they know what you're talking about. Right. And that is a pretty regular, uh, role within a lot of companies that sell to other businesses. So I took it upon myself to just really dive into that space of sales engineering. We started closing a lot of deals. We hired a team. We built it out really nicely. I left that job and joined Dropbox, which is where I work now, and uh, was doing solutions architect work here as well. And effectively what it was to me was the perfect combination of three things that I really needed, which was a technical focus on the product. I wanted to know Mm -hmm. how things worked. I didn't want to just be some of the, someone who stared at, um, a solution and was like, this doesn't make any sense. I wanted to figure that out. I wanted to be able to sell to people and be in front of customers and, uh, really honestly just have interactions outside the company. And then the last thing is I really wanted to have some kind of direct attribution to my work. I was really looking for reporting on the numbers that we did, the impact that you had. Uh, I wanted to be able to say, okay, this was how I did um, in a numerical sense, because it's really easy at work to not have a numerical sense of how you're doing. And I just wanted to have that measure if I could. 
really see that growth. I, I love that. Thanks for explaining it. it I, I think I mentioned one of the earlier messages that um, I've taken a lot of career tests because for a while there, when I wasn't working on Poly Innovator as much, I was looking for some kind of day job that I could do to work on and be able to work on this on the side. But um, Solutions Architect always came up in my top three, if not my second, as a, as a role that I should do. And so when I saw that you were doing that role, or at least did that role, I thought like, oh man, I want to pick his brain and see what, see what I can learn. But that's an amazing trifecta there. It's a great role. I will say it's probably one of the best jobs I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, I have a really amazing job now because I'm no longer a Solutions Architect, but I retain those skills because I really like doing it. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that gives you both the involvement of being in sales, but also knowing how a product is. And no knock on salespeople, but it's just not the job of a salesperson to know how everything works. Yeah. It's really important that they don't, in fact. It's really important that they're just good at selling and use a team around them to achieve uh, a successful sale. So some of my friends who are solutions architects, we just we just get really deep into how things work. We really want to understand and, and battle test what we're trying to provide to our customers. And we oftentimes are the ones who have to say no. Mm -hmm. Someone says to us like, hey, we, we desperately want to sell to this customer. And I have to sit there and look at it and say, this isn't what they're asking for. Our product isn't going to solve anything for them. In fact, they're going to hate us in about three months when they get this thing rolled out and they realize that it was just a mountain of work to get it to be the way they wanted to. So being able to walk away is really important in that role. Well, thank you. And it's interesting just because of how the balance between being able to be personable and technical is something that I love being. And I think that you obviously love being. And I think there's a lot of people who don't actually realize that it's an opportunity too. Like Solutions Architect is not necessarily a common uh, name. Like you said, it's also known as sales engineering. It's like, um, it's people just don't know it's out there. And so I just really wanted to kind of delve into that real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So you were actually mentioning curiosity is one of your drivers. My hero, Leonardo da Vinci, one of his life principles is curiosita or curiosity. It seems that you embody that really well. And especially with your one simple question podcast, what would you want to convey to people about that curiosity? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the anecdote because I think this is the easiest way to explain how my curiosity works because I can try to use my words, but I imagine I'll, I'll speak in a quick circle and all of a sudden I won't make any sense. <laughs> so... I had this analogy with a buddy of mine when we were traveling together and discussing the idea of this podcast that hadn't launched yet. And it was the analogy of walking through a forest. So I'm going to tell you to go to a forest. You know, you'll say you're in the UK and you go to like the forest of Dean or Epping Forest. And I want you to see the forest. Now, on one sense of curiosity, what you can do is you can actually just check out every single root, every single bark of the tree at, at your eye level and get a sense of the forest just by looking at the bottom of it. You're going to get an idea of the forest, but to you, it'll seem very dark. It'll seem like there's uh, generally life teeming above you, but ultimately you're, you're surrounded by a lot of brown and, and the ground. And by that, I mean the curiosity you, you could have with somebody is like, I want to meet a new person. I'm just going to ask them a series of questions that don't have any follow-up. Where are you from? What do you do? How many siblings do you have? The date questions that we all ask on a first date. And then there's the other side of it, which is find a big tree. Find a, a a tree that you think could uh, rise above the canopy and spend the effort. And, and then by effort, I mean that really, truly climbing that tree. And in this metaphor, it's it's talking about that one thing and it's learning a lot about that one person as they can explain to you from that path of conversation what their resp responses, experience, and reactions were. As you climb that tree and you get to the top, you're going to get a sense of what that forest looks like from the top. You're going to see the birds that fly away. You're going to see the green. You're going to see the span of it. And in my opinion, and the way that I am curious, I find that I know more about a person when I get a chance to ask that one question and dive into it versus had I asked you kind of like a million uh, resume-oriented questions. And so that's, that's where I get my curiosity. I have more fun learning something deep about you and finding out on the next conversation how many siblings you might have as a follow-up versus learning all I could about your resume on the first go and never really knowing much about you. Yeah. Well, it's that very deep dive, so to speak. Uh, and I, it, it really made me think of that whole width versus depth chart and how you really try to go for that, that like one pillar, that one tree. And once you get to the top, you get to have that kind of a uh, cohesive view of what that person was talking about because you were able to go so deep into that one pillar. And it, is, it makes me kind of like on, a other, on the other side of that, the kind of polymath in me makes me think about what if I was able to climb multiple trees in that same time span, like 
I don't know if that would be a waste of time because like they always say like a jack of all trades, a master of none, that kind of mentality. But as a polymath, we really want to go deep into those trees, those skill mm -hmm. trees in this case, but like in this analogy. But um, that's one reason why I kind of go divergent in a lot of the questions that I ask, especially with you. You had a lot of really interesting areas that I wanted to kind of delve into. I might have to have you on the podcast again just to <laughs> make sure we go into more trees down the uh -huh. line. But um Dustin, I think one thing to consider in that analogy, too, is that every single thing that we're talking about specifically, especially the way you're asking the questions, are not uh, quick pointed rapid fire answers. But the follow up and the curiosity makes it seem as though we're going to multiple forests, which to your analogy on the polymath side, a polymath just has multiple forests in their life. And it's a matter of choosing which one. And even on the podcast that I host, there are certain people that I know I want to bring back because there's a whole other facet of their life that we didn't talk about. We talk about one thing that means a lot to them, mm -hmm. but if we came back and chose a different tree, we would have almost a completely different show. And maybe I'll get a chance to do that, hopefully. What's interesting is that there's often a cohesive theme of an episode that gets created after the fact. So I often like don't make the title, but until I actually listen to the episodes, I can hear what the common theme of what our discussion is about. And so I'm, I'm thinking that considering the questions that are here, we skipped past a lot of them and moved around quite a bit. But one thing that's been kind of cropping up is that curiosity once and once again, no matter what part of our conversation, mythology, family, history, it's all come together to that curiosity and that insatiable want to learn new knowledge. You have so much experience and knowledge. If you were to write a book, what would fill it? Gosh, I, I think I already have a couple of books I'm meant to write that I'm totally behind on. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is I've always wanted to write a really cheeky or a fiction book, like a really cheeky, t uh, funny fiction ish book that had some odd tilt on it. Like the show psych back in the day that was humorous yet yeah. dealing with crime, uh, or even like killing Eve that's on right now on the BBC. That's uh, really, really, really intense, but also super random. If I were to write a book right now. I have a couple of interesting fiction stories I want to write around my culture or around modern retellings of ancient stories like the story of the Buddha, for example. If I were to look at a book from a nonfiction perspective and maybe what I would want to write about, there's this thing that I always remember when I was getting through the end of my time in San Francisco. It was like a resonation to me. And what it was was this idea that as a second generation immigrant child, I had this weird job of living at the precipice of two different cultures and trying to find a way to mix the two. Everybody says like America is a melting pot. I kind of firmly believe it's more of like a salad Yeah, that people do say a bit individualistic and parts do merge together a little bit the more you toss it, but it's really, really hard to get it all to be cohesively together. So the book I would write would be a little bit more of like a crash course into the first time you're dating a second generation immigrant, uh, helping somebody who's jumping into that space or that conversation and giving them the lay of the land from what I've seen. Cause you'd be surprised at how much is repeated. Yeah. Um, not to knock any you know immigrants to any countries, but you really try to retain a lot of your culture. I know that I've not tried to lose a lot of my Americanness here, but if I ever have a kid and I'm living in London at the time or just somewhere in England, I would not want to force them to be American, mm -hmm. you know, whilst living somewhere else. I'd have to find that general happy, happy uh, middle. Yeah. Uh, when you get that book release, let me know. I'll be one of your first customers. <laughs> I, I'll let you know. One thing we also have kind of have planned to talk about is different languages and cultures and just being someone with multiple uh, experiences in different cultures. Growing up, I grew up around the Hispanic community near me, uh, multiple different countries, but mainly a Mexican culture. Even my stepdad and my biological father are Mexican. And um, it's interesting how being, like, I, I wasn't an immigrant. My father wasn't an immigrant, but my stepfather was. And it's interesting how mentalities are different. Regardless of what country you come from, the, the act of tr coming here does change you in a way, as you probably know very well from your parents' mm -hmm. stories. And it's, it's just interesting how you could learn so much from that and learn from the culture. And like you said, trying to mix your cultures together like you you grew up in america but you also have that background from your parents uh origin and it's interesting just like you 
someone even told me before that like, oh, you're just a wannabe or something like that. It wasn't really like a wannabe. I was just wanting to mix them together and just have that kind of cohesive balance. You know, it's funny because in my life, I've met a lot of people who have partnered up with a child of an immigrant mm -hmm. and they're not. And it's really, really, really easy to vilify that person. It's really simple to think as a person who shares the same culture as, as maybe their partner, hey, why are you dating someone in my culture? Go find one of your own. It's really easy to view it as, hey, like, why are you putting yourself through that? It seems like a lot more effort than anything else. But the one thing I would never want anybody to feel, because, you know, if I've noticed the one thing on the mixing of, of cultures and religions and nationalities and races and all of that, is the best way to do it is to just be very open-minded about it, to just think about that person is now one of both facets. Um, my brother-in-law, his sister is Indian, and uh, she's married a white man from Chicago area. And one of the things I love about the two of them is that there's no real question as to where one starts and one ends, that mm -hmm. they just have this sense of being a community and a family, and they're making their own new normal, mm -hmm. and they're doing it in a really wonderful way, and their kids are multicultural. And that's just the thing that people are going to have to deal with as we get on. Well, and with the rise of globalization and how uh, interconnected we're getting more and more with the world, like you're in London right now, and yet I'm talking to you in the middle of the U.S. And just being able to have those new connections building up, becoming friends with new people, I think that with this globalization, there's going to be more and more multicultural families. And yeah. thinking about the genetics of it too, like people are, people always have spent the past thousand of years judging people on the color of their skin when in reality, we're all humans, we're all people, we're all... And most of the cultures, as diverse as they may be, they often stem from some of the same origins, like Babylon, that kind of thing, especially with mm -hmm. religion context. But it's just interesting how even diverse, we're still one whole. Yeah, we're all the same people. I think the only difference is the, the time that's spent between where we all started and where we all ended up. Mm -hmm. But if you we were to rewind the clock all the way to that point, we'd all be the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, my current girlfriend here in London is British from the North. Um, she's not any specific culture outside of being English, which is its own culture in a lot of ways. And she's teaching me way more than I thought I would ever learn. Um, I'm learning so many new words. So I used the word naff the other day, which I guess just means someone who has more money than sense. Hmm. So you'd call someone who is dressed in a three-piece suit with like all the, the trappings on like an 85 degree day in the US is like a naff. Like you have a lot of money, but it's too hot to be wearing that. Like, what are you doing? Oh, um, sure. I thought that was a funny term from, from my uh, Sunday. Yeah, definitely. Something I asked my guests and considering how we've already kind of delve into that multidisciplinary aspect, what is a polymath to you? You know, what's really funny is I didn't actually consider myself much of a polymath until uh, we really started talking. I knew the term, um, my sister, uh, my oldest sister was called a polymath at her wedding by my younger sister. Really? And she really is in a lot of ways. She she will be so knowledgeable about so much. Mm -hmm. And I would actually argue that all my siblings are polymaths in their own way. I think we're all just really built in to be like really humble and not say that. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I dove into this bit more and as we, you and I talked a bit more and, and prepped for this, I think I just realized that that same facet of what we've been covering this whole time, that, that curiosity really defines what a polymath is. Mm -hmm. A polymath isn't someone who's good at everything. I'm really bad at a lot of things, but I enjoy learning and doing them. But a polymath is curious. Uh, a polymath is curious about everything, mm -hmm. and they find the intention behind that. Yeah. Not just like, oh, I would love to get a motorcycle, but like, what reason is it that you're trying to get it? Is it the thrill? Is it understanding how the gears work? Is it being able to go around and do cruises? That's important, but just on the face level, saying that seems cool, I should do it, doesn't really describe the whole ethos of a polymath because. You want to learn and you want to get into a lot of stuff. You're not just trying to do things for the sake of checking them off a list. Right, exactly. That's beautiful. And that's, that's one of the only questions I make everyone ask, I answer. And every time I get an answer, it's always different. It's always very articulate and interesting like you just had there. I had an idea, but I, I was listening so deeply that I just completely forgot. But it's one of those things, too, where people often think polymaths are some kind of elusive person or being. But I really think that really anybody could become one, especially if you have the interest or curiosity to do so. And um, 
it really just comes down to what you want to do with your life. Like, what is your meaning? What is, what is the why that gets you out of bed? If you really just want to be a doctor in this one specific niche, that one field, that one special specialty, do it. But if you have some divergent interests, you want to be a mixologist, you want to be a solutions architect, you want to be a solutions architect for a brewery company, and so you can use both knowledges together. It, I think that's really delving into that um, duality or even multi potential as well. Yeah, that's the dream job, I think. Yeah. So something you kind of showed show me too before shakes on a plane. What can you explain shakes on a plane productions? <laughs> uh, shakes on a plane. Um, so my name will be Shake. Uh, when I first got my job, that first boss I told you about asked me if I had a nickname. Uh, all through college, the nickname that I got was Abhi. Um, Abhi in Hindi means now. It's kind of the thing my mom would yell at me when I need to get something done quickly. Uh, but I took it and I lived with that name because, you know, you're in college and everything seems very, very uh, amoebic at the time. So you'll just go with what, what works. Yeah. And as I got into work, I was like, I don't want to have that name anymore. I'm going to switch it up. And kind of like a Chris... Uh, coming from Christopher, I went the other way and I went with Shake instead of Abby Shake. Mm -hmm. And so that was my name. That is my name at, at any job that I have usually. It's just Shake. Um, and when I started traveling a ton and that movie Snakes on a Plane came out, oh. a very, very clever colleague of mine was like, why don't you just change all these things to Shakes on a Plane when you tell us you're flying? And I was like, that's genius. Yes. And unfortunately for the, you and the rest of the world, that has all that has just propagated to 2020 as well, even though that movie is super old. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so Shakes on a Plane is just sort of my own personal moniker. It's like the, the random phrase that I like to use to indicate maybe what I'm doing. I, shakes on a train, Shakes in a car, Shakes on a plane, whatever it is. And I had a blog for a while when I moved here, but also I started it when I was uh, on a sabbatical trip when I went to, basically I did a Western tour. So I started in SF and I went West until I got back to SF. Mm -hmm. um, and I called it Shakes on a Plane on that, on that sabbatical, which is probably one of the most interesting experiences in my life. And I just kept it when I moved here. So every time I traveled somewhere for a while, I would write a blog post about it, telling you about what I thought and, and how the life was there and the people and all that. And uh, yeah, to this day, I just kind of use Shakes on a Plane as my own personal brand, if you will. I really like hearing people's unique personal brands because there's a lot of personal brands that are just like your name. Like Abby Shake, just as a name is, is unique from where I stand, but maybe it's a common name for, uh, for India. And it's interesting. Yeah, like how it's actually a fun fact for you. Abby Shake is my cousin's husband's name as well. Huh. Yeah, so it is a relatively common name from where I'm from in India. Yeah. Okay. So then, yeah, it's common. <laughs> but like, if you had, if you just had Abhishek Lahodi as your personal brand name, there's probably. I actually, when I looked you up uh, the other day, there was someone else that was pretty popular that came up as well. But you at least actually have some really good uh, SEO going on, so that's good. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so like having someone's unique personal brand, such as Shakes on a Plane or Poly Innovator, it really kind of delves like, oh, what does this like entail? What is this? Yeah, yeah. I'll be interested in looking into those blog posts too, because I love there. Traveling. I paused the blog for a while, and maybe you can tell me this was a bad idea because everybody else has. But I paused the blog for a while because, as an American living in London and traveling all through these random places in Europe, like I did a road trip through the south of France with a buddy over a weekend. I went to Lithuania because I wanted to. I did a dog sledding trip. I realized very quickly that it felt as if I was boasting about this like amazing life that I had to all these people back home. And it gave me that dirty sense where I felt like I was being disingenuous with why I was sharing it. Though I knew in my heart what I was doing was writing a, a really cool an uh, anthology perhaps of mm -hmm. what I was doing in this time that I have right now. Uh, the responses in the comments are a little bit like, do you ever go to work? My God, are you ever in London? Uh, crazy to see that you're actually there. And so I didn't want people to feel as though I was trying to showcase my life too much. So I stopped writing, but I started keeping those logs for myself, like keeping the journal entries and the facts and the places that I went and the maps and the photos uh, all to myself, just mm -hmm. because I didn't want people to feel like I wanted to show off. I was just trying to indicate that life was really exciting and there's a lot of places you should consider going. Yeah. You were trying to be inspirational. And it, it, two of my people I look up to, Gary Vaynerchuk and Leonardo da Vinci, both of them have this kind of mentality of, I don't really care what other people think. And I think that if you adopted that, that would help quite a bit, but you're empathetic. So I understand why it would be hard to do so. And I get that like the decision of taking it off the public radar is probably, I mean, probably just de-stressed you, which is probably the biggest 
benefit yeah. behind it. And that's super important. But the fact that you kept the habit up is actually probably the most important, in my opinion, there is that you kept writing it. So especially all that fresh knowledge and experience was implanted into that, that blog or uh, at least personal journal. And so that way you, you kept the quality of it just off the internet. Yeah. And exactly. uh, so you could always re repost it later. And so one more thing to say before I, I stop talking is that Leonardo da Vinci had these fantastic journals that could have changed scientists all kinds like from at least a dozen different sciences from like ocular science light physics uh air physics that were locked away for like 500 years because of the church like and whatnot and uh, i'm not saying you're leonardo da vinci but maybe there's some kind <laughs> of like genius in one of these posts that will change someone's perception about traveling and that one person you impact could make a big difference in the long run so by hiding it away i feel like that you're doing a disservice to other people but i get that by posting and people being negative, it's a disservice to yourself. Yeah, it's a good point. I will say that I thoroughly enjoy just like going back and reading them too. Mm -hmm. um, and one last thing you should know too is is if you ever we ever get a chance to get out of these lockdown scenarios, um, Windsor Castle has a ton of Da Vinci codexes. You should come take a look; they're amazing. And I did a tour of in Buckingham Palace. There's a museum as well, and there's all Da Vinci sketches. Was the entire purpose of the entire tour. And I just went around and stared at all the stuff and the guy's drawings, his, his uh, understanding of anatomy from obviously going through human bodies, but un just knowing what they look like in motion and his failed endeavor at the copper horse that he tried so hard to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, even his self-portraits are just fascinating to take a look at. Yeah, I'll be ecstatic to look at those when I get a chance to travel. And it's interesting how even without the cadavers, he was able to visualize the motion like of, of a flight of a bird or the, the, mm -hmm. the motion of a man, like you were saying. And uh, one of my day jobs in the, over the years has been a swim instructor. And so one of the things I really talk about is the balance between the physics of it, the hydrodynamics and the philosophy. And so seeing someone swimming, you can see the way that they're pushing the water and the way they're propelling themselves forward and really change your perception about like, hey, is that being effective or not? And it's just really interesting how the curiosity involved with that as well. So one thing you're talking about was like Copenhagen and traveling around to these different places in Europe. And I remember hearing some time about you're switching from German to French in your final episode. Do you speak both of those languages well? I don't, I don't. I'm, <laughs> I wish, I wish I spoke French. It's, it's a beautiful language. I, I make an endeavor whenever I go to a new country to know enough to be able to speak the basic sentences to people. I think I owe it to that culture enough to be able to say a few basic things with more time in any country that I'm in, I, I tend to pick up that stuff anyways. It just naturally comes because you just hear it so much and your brain wants to start saying those words. So on that particular trip, I was in a car starting in Dusseldorf and just driving for, uh, I think like just two days, just driving around and exploring. And I crossed the border from Germany to Luxembourg because in the EU is basically just like the States. You just cross borders really quickly. And when I got out and I heard someone talking, I realized they were speaking French. And so instead of saying the guten tags at the end of my, uh, you know, interactions, I started saying merci beaucoup because you just, you just have to. Uh, and I thought that was really fun. One of those things as an American citizen, you really don't get an experience of. Yeah. Well, actually, as a little counterpoint to that, this was a singular experience and I don't know if it ever happened again, but I, I go to karaoke a lot, or at least I did uh, years ago. And uh, there were some people there who, I don't, I don't remember who they were at this particular point in my brain, but like, there was me, some other guy, some guy I knew, and I think one other person that I sort of knew. And all four of us were just kind of um, just being guys in a circle and kind of just being rowdy. But then we started cursing at each other in different languages. And basically, I would say something in like Spanish, and then he would talk to someone else in like German, and then they would talk to them in French, and then they would come back to me, and I'd say it back in French. Or it was just it was a circle of insults in different languages, and I just <laughs> thought that was a really beautiful experience. <laughs> Oh man, I went to the World Cup in Russia in 2018 and that's kind of the experience that I had there. It's like you're just sitting at a bar and you'd hear the Brazilians over here, the Argentinians over there, the Germans would be next to you, the Australians would be using whatever you want to call that language. <laughs> I don't I have a lot of Australian friends so I make fun of them for uh the style of English that they like to speak. Yeah. And it was just fun. It was fun to like get that full exposure to so many different tongues and realizing that in that moment so many languages are being spoken, but none of us could very easily speak the other language without really, really sounding like we're a foreigner. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and that's one thing that I think like, once you can get to the point where you can like mimic the dialect or the, the very least the uh, what's the word? Oh, the accent. The accent. Like, once you can like kind of copy the accent, generally it's kind of a good way. That's when you know you made it in a language. Yeah, I, I always stress about sounding like I'm copying an accent because when you sound like you're copying an accent, it sounds mocking really fast. But I love doing it anyways. So I will mess around with like my Australian friends and their accent. I have been starting to use my girlfriend's Northern English use a lot. So like instead of stuff, it's stuff. Uh, and she finds it really funny. I think she laughs, but I don't know if she's laughing at me or with me. <laughs> Probably both. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I love this concept of being a polyglot. And like poly is one of those words that you'll see on my, my website all the time and whatnot. But polyglot mm -hmm. was not even something I came up with. It's just the idea of being someone who speaks multiple languages. And if you just yeah. watch like any video on a polyglot, just seeing the fluidity of them switching between languages is fascinating. Oh, it's amazing. I do love when I get to go to other countries and like even in India, like knowing a lot of Hindi and speaking it very poorly, just being able to see the flow of it and then getting back into it and then grinding it out with a couple of days of awkwardness. But then by the end, speaking you know, much better Hindi than I did when I got there. It's it's super fun. And it's just crazy how your mind turns so quickly. Yeah. Well, and just a whole, whole bunch of dialects over there, too. So like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh I, and that's one thing you're talking about, like Hindi. I, I I grew up loving Bollywood movies, and so I'd often pick up just a few words of Hindi here and there. Oh, wow! <laughs> and um, so like I grew up a Spanish speaker. I love Bollywood movies. I uh, I have a lot of German in me, so I I like the language of Germany, and then I like listening to French music. So just exposing to as many languages as possible. Yeah, that's impressive. I would not have expected you to say the Bollywood fact, but I do appreciate that. And um, if I can recommend, just make sure that if you're going to watch one Bollywood movie, mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to get into it, and this is maybe for the listeners because you might have seen it, there's a really, really great one that's like easing people into it from a, a mix of English and Hindi and, and not like the song and dance routines every five minutes. Um, it's called uh, Zindagi Na Miligi Dabara. Okay. I said that without the accent because I don't want to be too camp on it, but um, just a really cool story. And it's one that I recommend to people if they're trying to get into Bollywood, mm -hmm. but then you can get real deep. And so if you ever watch like Kabi Kushi Kabi Gum, you can sit there for three hours and realize the movie could have been an hour and a half because they cried for about an hour and a half of the time. Yeah. Well, and like, it's funny because like, there's always that intermission and then it's basically like a sequel within the movie. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's crazy. Going to movies in India is a trip because you're, it's you're spending a lot of time of your life there and it's really fun, but, um, yeah, the tropes are great. Like the dance routines have to be in there. They used to not kiss at all. Now they do. Um, there was this really, really wonderful Hindi movie that was created ages ago that didn't have any song and dance routines. There's a couple of them that are a little bit more indie mm -hmm. and they're really great stories. One that I really liked was called, uh, Delhi belly that came out a little bit recently. The mother from, um, never have I ever on Netflix right now, which is Mindy Kaling show. She was in that movie and it just didn't have any music, but it was a fascinating and hilarious movie. But because it didn't have any music, it was flop in, Bo in Bollywood. Like no one watched it, uh, which I always thought was a bit sad. Well, uh, any of these that you can remember at the end of the call, please send them my way. I love watching new movies and whatnot. And in fact, I was actually just thinking just the other day, I want to watch more Bollywood movies around this like time. So definitely. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting just like how you were talking about like once you start hearing that language so much you start picking it up i wonder i started picking up uh, a lot of british kind of words just like calling people love or just like mates and uh just those kind of terms and it just felt natural to me but i wonder if it was like a psychological thing because i kept watching doctor who for just years <laughs> at a time and it is it's one of it those. is normal you're you're yeah i i get made fun of so much when i go back to the u.s from my like brothers-in-law and my family they're always just like what did you just say exactly? And sometimes it's even the intonation. If I ask a question and it sounds more British, they're just like, why did you ask the question that way? Mm -hmm. um, I say queue. I say pavement. Um, yeah, I say car park now. It's just sad. I miss some of those American words for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, you were speaking about the, you're making fun of the Australian accent. There's there's this girl, I don't, I don't remember her name. I'd love to give her a shout out, but she makes these TikToks. And I'm on the platform itself too, but uh, where she she lives in America, but she's from Australia, and she makes comparisons about pronunciations and just the overall changes in words. So like McDonald's in America is Maccas, in down, yeah, down, down yeah. under, and uh, it's just interesting how she's made, she's actually gained a lot of following because of these like comparison videos, and it's just interesting. Yeah, I think I've seen some like parody of comparison stuff on TikTok that uh, my friends have shown me too. I love that stuff though. I, like when we sit down together either my girlfriend or my Australian friends or something uh, and just 
like asking if these words made sense and even the Americanisms and them not knowing what they are. It's really fun. Well, kind of going back to the questions here, I, I guess you kind of already asked the answer, but are you a polyglot, do you think? I could be, I think. If I really oh. had the discipline to dive deep into the languages, which I've been trying to do, I, I briefly was picking up Italian and I was getting the hang of Italian pretty well when I was doing it. So am I a polyglot? No. Could I be a polyglot? I think if I put my mind to it, mm -hmm. um, I might be able to start getting into it. I have an endeavor to learn another language in my life. I know a bit of Spanish just because I grew up speaking it through school. Um, I know Hindi as well as I can know it right now. And obviously I, you know, speak some broken English um, for the Brits. So I would love to learn a bit more if I could. As a Latin language lover, I've always found that like once you learn one really well, and I'm not even super fluent in Spanish, even though I should be at this point, like you're saying with Hindi. Uh, it's interesting how just knowing a little bit of French, a little bit of Italian, and like a couple words in Portuguese, you can see the cognates between all of them. So some words that I don't know in Italian, and don't know in Spanish, but I do know in French, I'm able to figure it out between the three. So once you learn one, you might actually be able to kind of go exponential there. Sure. And learn some multiple ones. I get a little funny though, because like sometimes my Hindi comes out when I'm trying to speak Spanish and yeah. it's like, whoops, my bad. Well, there's uh, a lot of and, interesting words that like similar. Yeah, yeah. And then I like, if you're going for Italian, the double L is not the Y sound. So you have to say Bella instead of Bella. And you're like, whoops, I've totally screwed up that language. And then I think Portuguese is just on its own island. They're a bit strange over there, but I love it. <laughs> Sorry if I interrupted you new there. Uh, but yeah, no, okay. I love it too. So what's next for you after your first season of the podcast, considering that like working and we're still on lockdown at the time of this recording? I guess surviving is the biggest thing. Just, yeah. just trying to survive right now. What's actually next for me is I'm going to do the podcast again next season. I'm going to queue up conversations with people so that I can do it in like a bit more of a piecemeal manner. Um, I think a big thing for me this decade, and I say decade because in 2020, I made myself a couple rules, was I have, I have some goals for myself as I go from 34 to 44. Um, there are certain things that I do want to start to work on on myself personally. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are tangible, some of them aren't. Uh, but I think you can make goals like that and quickly forget them and then at a nine year mark be like holy crap i forgot i made those goals so for me i want to make some headway in that i want to focus my energy on like trying to be that better person that i used to think i was um and so i need to take a little bit of a break you know i need to get back into my mindfulness i need to uh, treat my body well especially in these times um i want to spend time with the people i can spend time with physically or over zoom and all mm -hmm. um, but when it comes time to achieve again when it, the time comes for me to push it again um I have some ideas on projects that I want to take advantage of with really, really great creative friends who are innovators in their own right, with the family that I have who uh, we can work really collectively nicely, or just anybody who wants to, you know, put down some elbow grease and see what we can make happen. Speaking of innovators, it's it's one of those things where when on the creation of this show, I obviously wanted to talk about polymath or whatnot, but the innovator aspect is what I was really wanting to build. And I think a lot of people confuse innovation with just technology, like solutions architect. But one thing I'm kind of getting from this conversation is that you have a lot of philosophical ideas that you've conveyed throughout this whole conversation, maybe consciously or not consciously, but I really love how you're able to probably innovate people's listeners mindsets through this philosophy that you've conveyed and the whole creating your own meaning and you aspiring for curiosity and delving into your own self-development saying it's also the perfect time considering the lockdown too to really kind of like take a step back and I, I really love that goal that you're making for yourself to really achieve those macro goals yeah I think it's really easy for me to stare at to go back to the analogy the, the trees and miss the forest mm -hmm. and I'm trying not to do that so it's really easy to get bogged down in the everyday stresses, um, you know, worrying about family back home and mm -hmm. uh, making sure your job is, is secure and doing well. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me right now will be to take a breath. Mm -hmm. I think we always forget to do that. We're running really fast all the time and I want to achieve a lot, but I know that like when I train for marathons or when I train for races that if I run every day, uh, by the race day, I'm going to just be broken and I won't be able to do it. So those rest days are just as important as the training days. Definitely. Uh, just as kind of a, another example of that, I've always done push-ups all my life as my one of my main cores of my exercise. And one, I think earlier last year or this year, I tried doing 100 push-ups a day. And that consistency actually 
negatively impacts me because like you said, the rest days are super important and I ended up burning out really hard. Mm -hmm. And that burnout is worse than just underperforming, I would say. Yeah, it's a lot harder to come back from burnout than just come back from two days off. Mm -hmm. So I wish you the best of luck on that. And I think that just taking a moment for you and me and those in the audience to just take a break to breathe in right now, even and just kind of taking a second to evaluate everything. So one of the last things we kind of go over is this, what do you think is the call to action for the audience today? I think the call to action right now is if it's, if you're listening to this while you're still in lockdown is just survive, like do what you can to survive. Um, don't be a dick, mm -hmm. just be kind and survive. But I would say the general call to action in general is what you just did. And it's take a breath when you're running full steam, when you're working really hard, when you're stressing about stuff, like three seconds, take a deep breath, let it go. Uh, you're going to feel a really, really good sense of calm. And when you're done with that, then take a look at what you're about to do. Right. Um, it's just going to make things a little clearer, I hope. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to thank you again for being on the show today. Like I said, I think you added a very unique po point of view on this episode. And I think that's very valuable to me, to the audience, and hopefully that our conversation helped you in a way too. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about Shakes on a Plane or about uh, your podcast, One Simple Question? Yeah, the easiest thing to do is just check out onesimplequestion.co. It's uh, all spelled out. Um, and on Twitter, it's One Simple Quest. On Instagram, it's One Simple Quest. Uh, and then shakesonaplane.com is that old blog. It's still live. You can take a look at it. Um, and I have some contact info there if you want to reach out and you're curious about something or you want to talk. Uh, I'm here. I love to respond to people when they reach out. Perfect. I'll have some links in the description for you. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much.